standing on one leg and the other leg holds a walnut and it alternates between holding it in its leg, in its foot and in its uh, uh, beak as it rotates it until it's in the right position to then get a bite, bite on it so it can get it open. <laughs> anyway, um, that's just parrots. Uh, how many people have not heard of Betty, the new Caledonian crow? Okay, I'd better show Betty. Um, Crows, magpies, rooks, the corvid family, they are extremely intelligent. Have any of you ever seen one build a nest? Um, I, I've seen a, um, a magpie partway through building a nest. I was sitting in the uh, back of uh, one of our rooms and looking up to the patio window at the top of a tree in the next garden. I'm just filling in time for everyone settled. Uh, and I saw this magpie flying up towards where it seemed to be building a nest with a twig held in its beak, uh, crosswise. And as it approached the nest, this was about 20 years ago, so I forget exactly when, um, its uh, motion was obstructed because there were two branches coming out and this uh, thing in its beak was too long, so it couldn't go forward. So it paused. Uh, resting on something. It went around to the side where there was another branch coming out behind the two that were obstructing it. It went onto that and as far as I could make out, I was looking at it from down below and trying to work out what was going on. It looks as if what it did was uh, standing on this branch coming to the side, push the end of this twig or whatever it was into the party bird nest until it was gripped. It let go, came back and went in through the way it originally tried to go in and finished off the job. I've asked a number of uh, biologists if anyone knows in what order birds like that build their nests. And it's uh, quite hard to find out because you never know where they're going to build the next one. So you could spend millions on putting cameras all over the place. So here's an experiment I'd like you all to take part in when you've got time. Um, find yourself a nice tree with a trunk and a say, branch coming out and a source of twigs, uh, various sizes and see if you can fetch one twig at a time and come to where this branch grows out of this tree and assemble a nest which is resting on this branch and you'll be willing to risk putting your eggs in when the wind blows. <laughs> um, if you can, I'd love it if you could have a video made of you doing it and send it to me, uh, Aaron Sloman at Birmingham uh, University uh, School of Computer Science, you get my email address. Um, because I have no idea how the early stages are constructed. Once you've got a partly built nest, it's not trivial to go on extending it to get the right shape. Uh, it's not like Lego where you can just put the two pieces together and they'll stick. With, uh, if you're building a nest, you put two twigs together and, well, you just blow and they'll fall apart. So um, you have to find some initial configuration that's highly unstable, which you can somehow eventually get into a stable configuration to which you can then start adding things. Have, does anyone know how to do it? Can you imagine? Okay, if you find out how, uh, I'd like to know. Um, at that time, when I saw this happening 20 years ago, I, I knew that it was way beyond anything robots could do. 
uh, at the time, and I still think it's way beyond anything any robots will be able to do in the foreseeable future. But there are things robots do that are deceptively impressive, and I'm going to show you one of them. Well, maybe we've all seen it. Uh, how many people have seen Big Dog? Was it shown here the other day? Okay, I don't need to show you. Well, just for, in case there's one, or one or two people who have not seen that, I'll um, <coughs> give you a, <coughs> the start of it. Um, and all of this is just setting up still. Uh, where's my big dog? Uh, I think it's that one. No, that one. Um, it looks like two people dressed up as a circus horse or something. But it isn't. <laughs> Uh, to the best of my knowledge, although that thing's very impressive and you kick it and it'll regain its balance and so on, and recently it's been able to hop, over th and hop along instead of just walking, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it has no idea what it has done after it's done it. It has no idea what it didn't do and why it didn't do it, or what it could have done and what the consequences would have been. It has no idea what it might have to do if it does something now. There you see it's responding in a very impressive way to being kicked. I suspect what's, uh, from the information I've been able to glean, that there are probably somewhere between 50 and 100 sensors of various kinds, including um, inertial sensors, which is what we have in our ears, that might have gyroscopes or something else, I don't know. <laughs> and, and it has been, and it's got a number of motors, um, uh, as you can see, the, it's got most, must have motorized joints, and it's got an envelope of parameters, and it's been programmed to detect when it's approaching the boundary of this envelope, and then to take remedial action, depending on which part of the boundary it is, and which direction <coughs> it's going, and how fast and so on. And it, as far as I know, it's all hand-coded by the designers at Boston Dynamics. It's not something that sort of taught itself all this stuff. Does anyone know anything that contradicts what I've just said? Because I'm always ready to learn. Yes? Well, I don't know very much, but what I heard contradicting that. Sorry? I, I thought that it was using reinforcement learning to learn how to get in back into the Well, system. I had assumed that that was how they had know. to get all that, uh, all the state space covered. But, but I'm told by someone... Sorry, let's just stop this. <laughs> um, you know, hey, if it fell over, could it get back up? What have I done wrong? Yeah. Um, I, I asked people who claimed to know, and they said no, it was all hand coded. But I'm, I might be wrong, and maybe they were out of they, their information was out of date or something. But either way, uh, the point is only that uh, the description I gave which is that it's a system that's got a, it's a dynamical system <coughs> that has um, a state which can be represented in point in a high dimensional space and it's, uh, the way it works is to just maintain itself within um, that uh, part of that state space by taking appropriate remedial action but, uh, and then it moved on to the next state. But as far as I know this thing, unlike the parrot, uh, has no idea about past, present, past, future, what ifs or whatever. I'm making claims about the parrot, of course I could be wrong, but for now I'm not going to debate that. Um, let me just show you a child aged, I think, about 16 months with a broom. Um, I'm still just setting things up. Uh, if I show the video, I think you'll go too fast. I'm just going to show a sequence of snapshots from the video. Um, there's the child. And let me get it. I usually don't have a screen with such good resolution. This mm -hmm. screen matches the resolution of my laptop. And so things that are small on my screen can not small there. Usually I cannot see. Anyway, you can probably see there's a little boy aged about 16 months. And he's holding a broom. And the back of the room is caught between two vertical bars in a, a railing. And he, uh, as it happens, I know, um, I wasn't there, but watching the video, you get a better impression than you can get from my sequence of snapshots. He seems to be aware that their, their um, the railings are constraining the motion. So he, as he's looking around, he sees what the problem is, immediately knows how to move it in 3D. Uh, perpendicular to the plane of the railings, 
so that it's no longer trapped between two of the railings. Uh, then swings it around to the other hand and pushes it forward. And then it goes into a skirting board and then he pulls it back. He can't push it any further forward, so he pulls it back. Um, then he seems to uh, decide, although he's looking at the person who's doing the video, uh, he seems already to have decided he's going down that corridor and the broom is being aligned to go that way and he starts pushing and following it. And now at the end he notices, or perhaps knew anyway, but anyway, there's a door on the right as you'll see shortly. Before he gets there, the broom handle is swung round so that by the time he gets to the door, the broom is in a plane perpendicular to the doorway so that when he gets there, there you are, you can see it's, uh, he swung it round. Uh, so he knew what he was going to do well before he did it and he took preparatory action. He didn't just react to the fact that he was falling over or, or whatever. Uh, when he got there, he then pushed it through and the video ends up there. Um, but there's nothing particularly remarkable about that. Uh, kids and dogs and, and, and all sorts of other animals are doing this sort of thing all the time. Although cats sometimes seem to be a bit lunatic. Um, uh, in the things they do, but nevertheless they have some, seem to have some idea of what they're trying to achieve, including, for instance, um, getting someone to open the door for them. Right, so those are some of the kinds of observations about products of biological evolution. And I'm going to go back a few billion years to my slides and get rid of the sounds of them. Let's just change the size. Um, I'm not going to go through all the slides, they're far too many, but <coughs> I'm also not going to go through them in sequence because I have no idea what this audience is going to want with me. Um, and that'll determine what I do. No, I think this is not a good idea. I'm going to have to shrink them again because the bottoms won't show. So if I go through size five, uh, that'll probably be all right. Um, so my, one of the questions, I'm going to ask lots of questions to which I don't have the answers, but I'm, I think there's a way of beginning to make progress here, uh, is how can a planet or a dust cloud produce microbes, mines, mathematics, music, marmite, and all kinds of other things. <laughs> um, and um, that's, um, thanks to NASA and Wikimedia, that's an artist's impression of solar system at some point where there was a sun and a cloud of dust and then lots of things happened uh, partly as a result of gravity, bits of material clump came together and formed uh, what turned out to be planets, some were just asteroids that continued, the tiny planets if you like and then there were lots of collisions and uh, there was uh, the, the, the things that formed in this space uh, were different distances from the sun, so some got a lot of energy from the sun some got to be little energy from the sun. Some of them had a lot of internal heat generated from maybe the results of gravitational attraction and, and radioactive decay and other kinds of things. For instance, our planet <coughs> generates a lot of heat, heat at the core, and I don't know as much about it as my wife, because um, uh, I'm an Earth scientist. Um, so it's kind of interesting that if you start with something like that, you can end up with a room full of people like this and uh, all the other stuff I mentioned, jumbo jets, parrots that can scratch the back of the neck, uh, forests, and microbes. Uh, they're the winners. If you count biomass, number of individuals, uh, the variety of species, they win on every count. So if you go around thinking that human intelligence is somehow a great advantage, think again. I learnt from the internet, I don't know whether you can believe everything on the internet, but I believe this, that if you count the number of cells in a typical human body, which are human cells produced by the human genome, and you count the number of bacterial cells in a typical human body, which have bacterial, whatever, genetic material in them, there are ten times as many, which? Bacteria. Bacterial cells. Okay. Um, that's an interesting thought. And we need them, they're not just there getting in the way. Um, probably most people in this room know about the bacteria in the gut, but without which you wouldn't be able to digest your food. Apparently they're all over the place doing things that you need. Uh, I didn't know there were so many of them. So there's something about what that did, which built 
a huge variety of types of things on all sorts of scales. Um, I don't know if, are there any spare seats? It doesn't look like it. Well, there are two here. I don't know if we can do anything with them. Uh, someone at the back. I'll put it here. Seeing my slides won't be absolutely essential. If one wants it, there's one there. And in fact, there are a couple at the window. Um, so, how do you get from a cloud of dust over only a few billion years? Now, let's see. Um, would anyone like to guess at a number which roughly indicates the number of what you could regard as design decisions involved in the history of the human, of human genome? How many changes were there from the earliest prebiotic molecules to now? Um, I have no idea, but would it be closer to a thousand, a million, a hundred million, a billion? Anyone know? My guess is it's well over a million. And how many options were there for each of those decisions? Um, I don't know, but it's more than two. And if, if there are two options that if, and you've got a, a billion decisions, uh, then you've got a kind of search space to explore of two to the billion. And you can do some arithmetic to find out how many universes you need to fit that in before you came up with a, something really special uh, buried in that space um, that required a billion choices. I think it wouldn't, any, anything built on any current searching techniques wouldn't fit into the universe. Um, but that's, that's just hand waving. I mean, um, clearly, uh, Cloud of Dust didn't do a typical AI search, did something else, and the question is what else? And at this stage, I don't really know, but I suspect that if Turing had, been, had lived longer, uh, the work he started, uh, which led to the publication in 1952 of a paper called Morphogenesis, might have taken him on to produce um, answers to the sorts of questions I'm going to ask, which I'm not clear enough to answer. How many people have read the Morphogenesis paper? Okay, a tiny subset. In this, he uh, he expressed a conjecture which he partially supported by a computer program and imagine what it would be like running a computer program in 1952. The conjecture was, I don't know what we can do about the people still trying to get in. Um, there are a couple of seats available right at the front if you want to work your way through. Um, his conjecture was that if you've got a couple of chemicals uh, which react together and they diffuse at different rates, and you make a number of assumptions, then uh, during the process of cell division and growth of an organism, they can produce patterns of various kinds. And uh, as examples, I think he was thinking of things like stripes on a tiger and, and spots on a leopard, and the spiral configuration of seeds in a fur cone and things like that. So the idea there was that if you've got the right kind of stuff to start with and then you stir it all up and let it run, it will naturally form structures that you would never guess just by looking at what it starts from. And it can produce a wide variety of those structures using the same mechanism if you just slightly change the parameters, like the rates of diffusion and so on. So maybe if you have more than two molecules, um, <coughs> how many at types of atom were there initially, I don't know, but probably uh, something of the order of 100 before very long, types of atom, types of chemical element, and many ways of putting them together to form larger structures, not just reaction and diffusion of the sort that, um, that um, Turing talked about. Um, then, you get an in then you've got a kind of um, engine which is capable of a huge variety of changes of two very different sorts. One type of change is continuous, where things get closer or further apart, or they change their orientation, or one goes inside another, or comes out, or whatever. And those are continuous spatial changes, and another is locking into a relationship that's stable, thanks to quantum mechanics. Um, and the stable relationships may last quite a long time, survive thermal buffeting, but they may be capable of being reorganized either by um, some strong physical force, you know, some pulling it apart, hammering or whatever, or 
by another little chemical coming along, producing some sort of catalytic reaction, and very rapidly you can get things real. So that's a bit more complicated than the situation Turing was thinking about. Uh, but it may, those complications may provide a kind of generative power which not only produces lots and lots of shapes, as his morphogenesis paper has suggested, but I'm going to suggest produce lots and lots of ways of acquiring, using, transforming information. And we know in some sense that that must be the case. Uh, you can't have life without information. Uh, that's now sort of obvious in terms of the kind of information needed to replicate uh, an instance of a, of a type. Um, but I think there are a number of people who would agree that every organism is constantly doing whatever else is doing, it's doing information processing. Your metabolism involves processing your information down at the molecular level. Your digestion is processing information, working out how to decom what to decompose and what to say where and you know, get energy and, and materials and whatever results. <coughs> and that's in addition to the information processing that involves external sensors and control of your motors for interacting with the environment. Um, I'm not the only person who thinks that. I, a couple of days ago I found a paper, <coughs> oh, I've said all that. That's the list of topics I'll have to come back to. The third paper on the list, um, I just stumbled across it uh, on the way here. Uh, Farnsworth, Nelson and Gershenson. Does anyone know any of them or this paper? It, uh, well, it, it's on the web and I'll put my slides on the web and if you want to. I like the title, Living is Information Processing, From Molecules to Global Systems. Does anyone have any objections to that? Maybe it's a sort of trite thing to say and everyone agrees. Well, okay. it all depends on what the meaning of is is, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Bill Clinton. You surprised me, because I thought you were going to say it all depends what you mean by information. <laughs> <laughs> Which is part of the next section. Um, so, um, Paul Davis is a physicist, and this book addresses some of the issues that I was talking about, but the title might lead you <coughs> into thinking, especially as this funding comes from the Templeton Foundation, might lead you into thinking it's, it's, it's inspired religious mythology, but it isn't. He just chose the title because apparently on, on Genesis, in Genesis, it says that on the fifth day, the plants, you know, the first living things were made. And that's why it's calling it the fifth miracle. And the question is that he asks, but I don't think he answers, but it, he presents the question in quite an interesting way, including starting back from the cloud of dust and all kinds of prebiotic molecules and so on. Uh, where could the information come from that in some sense wasn't there in that cloud of dust, but is there even when you've got the first bacteria swimming around in the ocean, uh, let alone the information required to make marmite? Um, <laughs> or monkeys, or parrots, or, or trees, or, or skyscrapers, and so on. Um, and uh, I, I'll have to say something about how I use the word information. Um, because the way he and others, and probably some of the people in the room now, understand that question, where does the information come from, um, you're thinking in terms of Shannon, and various kinds of conservation laws, and entropy, and whatever. And it may be that from that point of view, it's not a problem because this um, planet isn't a closed system and not even the solar system is a closed system. And certainly the portions <coughs> of the dust cloud as they form are not closed. They're getting huge amounts of energy from the sun. So in principle, you can say, well, there's no problem about lots of energy coming in and causing things to be rearranged to form structures and so on. But that in some sense doesn't answer the question, how, how can you get this particular kind of information, information for making parrots and spiders and um, crabs and bacteria and so on. Anyway, I don't think he, he produced an answer, but at least it's a good way to think about the question. He does say at one point there's, there's some evidence that the first life on this planet may have come through asteroid fragments or whatever from Mars, but that's still I suppose the question, how does it get into Mars? Um, this is just 
uh, a nice, relatively modern overview of Darwinian theory and the way it's influenced art and other kinds of things. Um, and then this is just a rather narrow thing. But it turns out that although it sounds as if they're saying the same thing as I am, they're focused on the Shannon notion of information. And I think, however useful it is and however, however important it is for, um, for engineering purposes, Shannon's notion of information is deeply misleading. It didn't mislead Shannon. He knew exactly what he was doing. But unfortunately, he chose the word information as a label. And if he'd chosen another information, lots of people wouldn't have been misled. Um, and I will try, is it soon after this? Mm, never mind. Uh, to say what I mean by information. Let's um, temporarily just shut that off. Uh, can I get a blank screen? Yes, let's get a blank screen. Um, so what's information? I would like to offer you a thought that is going to be blindingly obvious to some of you and to others will be obviously false, I think. Uh, information has nothing to do, in, uh, nothing primarily to do with computers or bit patterns. Uh, bit patterns just happen to be one of the ways in which information can be encoded and um, there are many people who make a living out of doing things that involve bit patterns and without which you wouldn't have the internet, for example. But consider <coughs> the following situation. You're an elephant and you're lumbering along a path and, and you want to go, <coughs> there are all these big trees, and you want to go through this path which elephants before you have made. And there's a great big boulder which wasn't there before. Now, if you're an elephant, you might be able to do something about that boulder, depending on the size of the boulder and the intelligence of the elephant. And you might be able to push it out of the way, push it sideways. On the other hand, suppose it's not a big boulder, but a tree trunk that has fallen across the path. In both cases, there's something blocking the path. And both might prevent continued onward walking by this elephant and its family. Um, now, at one level, you can say there's only one bit of information there which answers the question, is the path blocked? Yes or no? Yes, it's blocked. But if you want to interact with the blockage in order to fix it, then that's not very much. In the case of the boulder, you have to get a lot of information about the size, the shape, the various surfaces that might be pushable, the potential obstacles in the immediate environment, uh, because it might be one way of pushing it, it'll go straight into a tree, another way of pushing it, and maybe there's a slope downward, so if you just start moving it in that direction, uh, gravity will, will help you and so on. If you push it the other way, you're going up the slope, and that's going to be much more effort. So if you can get all that information and use it to control what you do, then if you say, how much information does the elephant get from that boulder? As far as I can see, it's, it's an ill formed question. It's not, the, the information content is not something like a length or a volume or a weight to which you attach a number. It's got a rich internal structure, some of which I elaborated by talking about the surfaces and the relationships to the environment and the possible consequences of acting on the thing. And if it's a tree trunk, those will be very different. Um, and it may well be that uh, an elephant can't cope with the tree trunk, but it can cope with the boulder. Or if the surrounding is appropriate and the tree trunk's appropriate, it's not very big, uh, it might be able to go round to one end of the tree trunk where there are lots of branches and things, and either on its own or with its mates, pull this thing off the road. So that would require very different actions, not just in the global structure of where the forces are applied and what the consequences they produce, but the detailed control of the motions of trunk or whatever. Can elephants pull things with their teeth? <laughs> I've never seen an elephant's uh, grazing mammals do. Um, uh, the ones that eat grass. But anyway, they use their trunks. Uh, so they might be able to get their trunks around, around uh, the leaves and branches and pull and so on. But I've suddenly begun to wonder whether they, they would have a good enough grip with their trunks for doing that. But never mind. The point is, uh, if, if they could, or if we could, we'd be doing something very different. 
uh, to deal with the trunk, and we'll be using information that's very different, but the difference is not in any interesting way related to the number of bits that could be used to encode it, or any kind of measure of how much information, it's the content. Now, so information, in the sense in which I'm using it all the time, is about something, uh, semantic content, there's, there's something that is referred to, and there may or may not be a user, but typically in all the contexts that we're, we'll be talking about in connection with living organisms in life, there will be users, and the users will be the organisms, uh, but the particular source of information doesn't need to be a message that's produced by some other agent, such as Shannon was thinking about when he talked about transmission of signals and across uh, information carriers and so on. In the example I gave you, the source of the information was the boulder and the stuff around it in one case, and the tree trunk and the stuff around it in the other case, plus information that the elephants already had about how, how to do with, deal with things like that. And they're able, to get, they're able to use the new information and the old information in order to form a very complex, if they do succeed, series of muscular movements, which they probably don't think of as muscular movements, but they apply forces of various kinds to the things out there to produce a change. That all make sense? The source of the information is the light that bounces off the boulder and actually goes into the eyes of the elephants. That is the immediate source, but if you stop paying that down, you can say it's not even the light, it's the retinal uh, activity, and it's not even that, it's the neural signal. So there, there are many ways at which you can yes, cut the point, you. and then you get different descriptions. And, uh, for instance, there, there are ways of thinking about vision, especially associated with David Marr, who's a very bright guy, but I think he, he also misled a number of people mm -hmm. by suggesting that the function of vision was to take an image on the retina that was produced by the process of light bouncing off surfaces and so on, and then reverse that process to give you back detailed information about where all those surfaces were, how far away they were, how, what their orientations are, and maybe some other things. Whereas James Gibson, who's been lurking over my shoulder and trying to make sure I say the right things, or it's ghostly, uh, said, no, that's not the way to think about the perceptual information that animals get. Um, the perceptual information is about what he called affordances. And my little story of elephants encountering boulders blocking their path, or tree trunks blocking path, was all about not where the individual surfaces are, nor what route the light took from there to the retina or whatever, but information about what kinds of actions are inhibited by the stuff and what actions are enabled to remove that inhibition or blockage or whatever. And uh, there's a lot of very complex processing of that information required, but I have no reason to believe it's remotely like bit manipulation. What brains do, I don't know. But going back to what I was saying earlier about Turing, it may just be that if he looked, he'd have said, OK, you've all learned about Turing machines. Now here are some kinds of things that are very different than molecular machines, and they can do different kinds of things if you find the right way to organize them. And you'd be very surprised to see what kinds of things they can do, just as you're surprised to discover that Turing machines can generate and find for themselves proofs of quite complex mathematical theorems, if you interpret the symbols on the tape properly. Um, anyway, so uh, somehow biological evolution has produced organisms which can acquire information not from intelligent or non-intelligent information transmitters sending signals along some channel, primarily, but from all sorts of things in the environment, which I call self-documenting. That's to say, the boulder has a lot of information about itself. The tree trunk has a lot of information about itself. The surrounding environment and the combination of it <coughs> has a lot of information about that configuration. But the information will have, um, will be indeterminate in, in an important way. Uh, if a housefly comes flying down to do you get houseflies in the jungle? Anyway, if a fly comes flying down to rest on the rock, uh, the light bouncing off the rock will go into the 
flies compound eye. But it's almost certain that the fly will not see anything like what the elephant sees. It will get very different information. It might get information that it can use to control its deceleration as it makes contact with the surface so it doesn't go crashing into it. It might get information that makes it choose a place where there's something oozing out of the bark that it might want to uh, uh, feed on if it's if it's a tree trunk rather than a boulder and so on. <coughs> so uh, the information in physical and biological structures is not uniquely defined by what's there in the physical bit of the world. Uh, it's there's a lot of potential for information to be acquired from it, but in order to acquire it, you need things with the capacities to make use of certain sorts of information, and things that don't have the capacities will not be able to get that information from the structure. So there's something highly interactive about getting information in the case of organisms, as opposed to what happens when bits come along a, a cable and into a computer. The, the bit pattern, the structure, and the process of arrival and, and storage um, have a structure that's de defined entirely by what was transmitted at the other end of the cable, if everything's working as expected. Of course, as you knew, you have errors of transmission. Okay, so I'm trying to say there's a, a notion of information that is much, much older than Shannon's notion, which is what um, Romans might have talked about when they asked about what information Caesar had about what was happening in a battle somewhere in France, or whatever they called it in those days. And um, uh, they're using information in the sense that I'm using it, except it was about different subject matter. There are people fighting, not boulders obstructing things. Any comments, objections, proposals? Couldn't you encode the type of information that you're, you're referring to in, uh, in the same, in sort of uh, bit patterns? Uh, yes, and I'm sure you'd do better than I would. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the question is, would that encoding be useful to anything? Uh, it might be, for example, very useful for generating pictures on a screen. It might be useful for generating text depending on what's in the bit patterns. Uh, whether it would be useful to enable a robot elephant to work out what to do to enable it to continue moving down the path is another question. And a lot of current work in AI robotics and so on assumes that information that you get in bit patterns from TV cameras and other kinds of sensors <coughs> is after appropriate transformations in a useful, usable form. Um, and I have an open mind about that. I suspect the problem is not so much that form in which it's immediately received, but the forms in which it's processed after that, that need to be changed. But that's another long story. Yeah, I think the, the contrast between Shannon information and other kinds of information couldn't be overstated. Because, I mean, you can mathematic, you can, you, you can look at Shannon information, say, as mutual information on the space of probability distributions over program space. And, 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 and then the, the Kolmogorov complexity, the algorithmic information, is similar to Shannon, Shannon information, because mm -hmm. each program induces a certain distribution on program space, and then you, have, you can measure the Shannon information, the kobach libra distance or fisher information between distributions on program space. And, and so the then, boulders are coming where? What's that? <laughs> Well, uh, where were the boulders, or tree trunks, or blockage of pathways come into what you just said? Well, I mean, that, that's just a question of, are, are you saying you can't mathematically formalize the, the world, no? I mean, No, I'm saying that the description of the content of the information that's useful to an elephant is not expressible in terms of a number of anything. It's a collection of relationships and possibilities for change and causal implications of those changes. Sure, but you don't, I mean, you could represent relationships and, and causal implications. I mean, relationships can be represented in relational logic fairly straightforwardly, and ca causal implications are also logically represented. As, as we saw in Abram Dembski's talk yesterday, you, you can look at probability distributions in, induced by sets of logical axioms, which could be interpreted in terms of 
of Shannon information on probability distributions over statement space, or the statements in a logic system. Okay, this is very useful because it saves me the trouble of raising the objection. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, you have Suppose you would split the brain of the, of the elephant in some arbitrary way. Yes. And in between, you put some kind of a communication. And the elephant would Corpus die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the elephant would die, but yeah. suppose it would, uh, it would survive. Then, in principle, I'm, I'm, I mean, you can you can formalize in, even in Shannon terms the the signals which go over the neurons. Right. Between so the two two halves of the brain. It makes some distinctions because I think you're both saying closely related things. I have talked about information, but I haven't explicitly talked about information bearers. Uh, information, in order to be usable, has to be in some way encoded in something that, um, at the time of use, and in some cases, that may be a long time after the information is acquired, but at the time of use, that information must be accessible. So you need something that carries that information. Now, before the elephant came along, the rock did that. The rock and the paths and whatever held the information in a way that was accessible. On the other hand, if this elephant can't push the boulder out of the way, and it's got to go and fetch some helpers, and it wants to go and explain why they should come and help it, then it may have to have some way of giving them information which will be different from going and taking them to the boulder, or replicating the same blockage, which maybe elephants can do, but I doubt it. Um, and it might use some sequence of hoots and blips, or ways of waving its trunk, or waves of moving one shoulder and then another, or transmitting radio signals from one brain to another, which might be going on in ways that we haven't discovered yet. Um, in all of those, there will be carriers of the information that allow information that one thing has to go to something else, so that they can then do something. In one case, they may decide to accept an invitation to come and help, or a request to come and help. So, yes, there are information bearers of many kinds, other than the original objects about which the information uh, is. Uh, so, the, the information is about the boulder, but it can be encoded in all sorts of things. And, the, and as we know from lots of work in AI and other and mathematics and, and the long history of map making and so on, how you store information can make a big difference to its usability. And there are some ways of storing information that are very useful for particular applications, uh, but then they require you to go to a lot of trouble. For instance, if people want to do navigation, um, it's much more helpful for them if they are given maps which at least preserve some of the geometric structure of, of the surface over which they're navigating. But in principle, you could give them lots and lots of sentences about what's the left of what and what's uh, so many feet or meters or whatever from what. And the information would still be there, but it wouldn't necessarily be uh, usable in the same way with the same amount of ease, although it might be possible to transform it into a map and after which is a map. So I think everything that uh, Ben was saying referred to information <coughs> encoders and their properties. And that's what Shannon was talking about. Not the semantic content of the information, but features of the information bearers that are relevant to a whole variety of, of problems, including reliable transmission, detection of errors, uh, and in the case of the logical uh, case, uh, something that's close, more closely connected to the use of the information, uh, because of the following facts that I have not made explicit. If you have two items of information, in the sense that I was using the word information, there can be some important relationships between them, like entailment. If this one's true, then that one's also got to be true. But it needn't go both ways. Um, now, in that case, for example, if, if the um, boulder is spherical in shape, then no part of its surface is planar. Now, when, when I give you those two pieces of information, that it's very in shape, I didn't mention anything about planes, uh, but there is an entailment relationship. Now, 
one of the features of logic is that you can, uh, in many cases, if you choose the right collection of ways of expressing your, your um, information, uh, turn the problem of deciding what entails what, or whether things are inconsistent or not, into a problem of doing geometric operations on the notations. And that is very powerful, and I think that's part of what Ben was assuming in the examples he was giving of well, ways of encoding information. I mean, what I think is you can encode this using, I mean, not, you can't encode this using Shen information in an obvious and trivial way, but I mean, you, you can encode it mathematically. You can encode it mathematically in a way that Shen information is, is applicable to. I don't think that really solves the hard problems of. Of the, of the situation, though. I mean, it, okay, just, okay. it, just, it just formalizes things, right? I mean, right. It, it's a formalization. It doesn't necessarily and it get you that far. to be one formalization that's very useful for a wide variety of problems. Well, how the is only question I'm <laughs> inviting you to consider is: Might there be other f formalizations of the same information of the information content that's rel relevant to organisms but, but, but that is much more easily accessible to the organisms in from the physical environment? and more easily usable for their practical sure. for achieving their goals. Yeah, that is. Sure, there is. Because I think the difference simply is that Shannon simply tells you something about information content. And also Kubert Lipper type of stuff <laughs> tell you something about the, the, the quality of certain information. But it doesn't tell you anything about the utility of the information. Well, so I'm not even sure the use, what The usefulness about. of the information. Yeah. So <laughs> because that's implicit in, in, these, in these measures. So what you would like to do is have an extra definition of what is useful information in this time. Yeah, so I also agree that there is this other notion because like, say you were watching static on a television. Shannon information says there's lots of information in there, right? Because we need to specify every bit. But in some sense, that's not conveying any information to us. That's right, because you so have to know what the encoding is. We can, we can use a lot of things from Shannon information theory to say, well, Maybe this television set doesn't have any mutual information with the things that we care about, or something like that. But hey, a, a, there a is brief, some. A brief announcement. So it's almost ten. So so people want to go to the other. The Crest tutorial starts at, at, at ten, which is a basically a practical tutorial on using the the Crest cognitive architecture. Also, so. copy. There is copy. Uh, okay, so, so we should have, have a, a project or exchange of copy and people. Just a <laughs> couple of, couple of uh, uh, sentences before we break for coffee. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I don't actually want to spend a lot of time on the Shannon thing for the simple reason that I think one could spend all day discussing it and not actually answer any of the questions that I'm interested in talking about today. I just want to mention that there's a lot of effort put into that which uh, looks to people as if it can do something that I'm talking about, but I don't think it can. Now, when I've told you more about what I think is needed, you can then show me how to do it using, uh, making use of Shannon's idea, and that'll be great. <clears throat> so, uh, before we break, was there anything that was bothering anybody else that hasn't come up yet? It's not a bother exactly, but yeah. you said you were going to show Betty. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh yes, that's right, for people who haven't seen Betty. So where's my uh, list of videos? Betty is a new Caledonian crow, and they're a particularly intelligent class of corvids, um, who sometimes um, make tools of various sorts. For instance, they get leaves and cut serration along an edge, and then they'll put the leaf down a crack in something, a rock or whatever, and get uh, a larva or something that's hiding there out, and that's one of the ways they get food. Uh, they also have ways of fishing for larvae, so the, some of the larvae go down uh, cylindrical tubes, and there's some wonderful work done by um, Jolyon Trosyanko for his PhD, where he built a fake tree trunk with a camera inside, and this tube was transparent, and you could see from the inside how uh, a crow standing on the outside of this thing could fish with a a twig, uh, <coughs> trying to get the twig to the point where the larva would bite it, you can put it out. So that's an indication of their, um, sometimes the larva's pointing down and then it just makes a mess. Um, it doesn't get it out. So that's some background. And uh, Jackie Chappell managed to capture a male and female Betty and Abel, take them to the Oxford Ecology Lab, 
and they were giving, doing some experiments to see whether these birds would be able to use a hook made of wire to get food out of a glass tube. And the, the food was in a little bucket at the bottom, so the bucket had a handle, and they couldn't reach it with their beak. Now, both of them, if they were given a, a hook made of wire, so straight piece of wire with a bend on the end, both of them very quickly saw that that would solve the problem. The male and the female separately did that. And they were ready to start writing their papers, and something happened that wasn't expected. Uh, I think the male flew off of the hook, and the female came along, looked around, and found a straight piece of wire. And uh, that was Betty. And to their amazement, she made hooks. Uh, this was the seventh, way, the seventh video. They had about ten videos, one after another, because the first time she made a hook, she stuck the wire into the edge of the tray, which you'll see in the screen, and it didn't grip the end very well, but it gripped enough to get a slight curve, and she went along and got the hook, the bucket out, using this slightly curved piece of wire. But um, if you can make a hook one way, maybe you can work it in another way. She tried several ways, and the one that's most famous is the one I'm going to show you. So, um, I think that's the male taking the hook away. And, um, or no, maybe, okay, anyway, now we have Betty with a straight piece of wire. She's standing on this thing and trying to get the bucket out. She could sometimes get the bucket out by pushing the wire through the handle, pressing it against the opposite wall, and lifting it, which is no mean feat. Um, but in this case, she doesn't do that, and after a while, decides to do something quite different. No messing around, no trial and error. She just sticks the end into the ducting tape that's holding this tube. The, the tape holds the end of the wire. She pulls the other end round. <laughs> just checks quickly there that she's got a hook, as you can see. Notice that her leg is up there. She's going to need it soon. She can't get that height if she didn't have a leg there. Um, so that was trial seven. And uh, they gave her 10 trials, and the publication didn't go into any of the detail that I'm telling you now, but the videos are on the website. You can go to the Oxford Ecology Lab and look for their video and picture page. Um, and uh, I, the published paper said she made hooks 9 out of 10 times, and didn't say what happened on the 10th time, but when I asked Jackie, she tried to remember it, she said she thinks that was when she just pushed it through and lifted. Um, but she made hooks in several ways. I've told you two ways, uh, very quickly, two other ways were flying up to a peg on the wall, just sticking out of the wall, next to which was a hole. She landed on the peg, stuck the end in the hole, bent it around, went back, and right. And another way was flying up to a uh, railing, uh, where she, holding the wire, where she could bend down, then lift her foot up, grab the wire, she wouldn't have been able to do it in that certain, grab the wire on the railing, and then pull the other end up, so she got a bend and then came in. And this is all on video. Is there anything like wire in their natural environment? Uh, no, not in New Caledonia where it's all forests and so on. Unless you, the, there are twigs, uh, but normally twigs either are elastic, you yeah. let go, or else they're brittle and they break. Oh. Um, but they do, oh, I didn't mention this, they do uh, sometimes make hooks out of a forked twig. So if you've got a twig like that and a fork like that, you can break off this end completely, and you can make this one a bit short, and you've got that and that. And they do that to get things out. So, okay, they, and that, that may be genetically encoded, or maybe a cultural thing that that group of them, I don't know. But the point is, uh, they did know something about the functionality of hooks, which is why they gave them hooks to see whether they transferred to these bits of metallic stuff. I mean, how did they learn, learn about the properties of wire? That? is a good question. Um, maybe they have come across something else we don't know about that has the property of being plastic. Maybe you can bend it and hold its shape. But they had, but he had, had some exposure to pipe cleaners. Oh, I didn't know that. I knew that they'd done that with teenage children who were, <laughs> they failed the test of teenage children. But Jackie told me that, that the pipe cleaners just kind of crumpled up and didn't oh, I see. Okay. That, well, I asked her that. Because right, that okay, well, fine. All right, I guess people will run some coffee and uh, we can aim to get back in about, let's say, 20 minutes and see how that works. The genetic encoding kept on being developed and I'll get some on for both of you. Um, actually, while I'm here, do I know what I did with my... I thought I'd put... 
something on this table which is not here, but I can't remember. Well, maybe it's in my deck. Um, okay, shall we continue then? Yep. Um, no, really? This is, sorry? Um, maybe someone someone make can we wedge the door open? Yeah, we can wedge the door open, but maybe someone should tell everybody in the coffee um, room that we're starting well, again. Well, when I organise conferences, I do that, but not when I'm the speaker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you didn't have to yourself. <laughs> Unless we've got a client. Sorry? I said you can be vicious. I wasn't being vicious, I was just describing my policies. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going to move. Okay, there are people still kind of moved, so I'm sorry I moved it. Oh. Alright. Well, then it's moved. Well, this, th there's so much stuff and it doesn't have a, a simple progressive structure, so I can just start and people who are coming can join in. Um, this is just um, uh, a kind of general flag of warning because there are sometimes people who ask questions about evolution uh, which start from the assumption that there's some big discontinuity, like for instance, there must be things without consciousness and things with consciousness, <coughs> and they wonder what the transition was and how it came about and so on. And then you get people who say, no, you got it wrong. For instance, Susan Greenfield is one who for years has been saying, it's a continuum, it's, there are lots of there are gradual changes from microbes and so on to humans, and in between things get more and more conscious on the way. And um, I think neither of those two, that there are, there's something that there are huge, great big jumps, or that everything's continuous, is correct. There are lots of discontinuities, and some small discontinuities, and some bigger discontinuities. And it has to be discontinuous if uh, genetic information is encoded chemically, because you can't have sort of half a molecule being added, half an atom being added to DNA to produce so sort of an, or a quarter of an atom or whatever. Uh, another way of thinking about it is if there is no inheritance of acquired characteristics, so you can only get changes across generations, then between any two times there will only be a finite number of possible genera genera um, generations. And therefore there must be discrete changes uh, to get from A to B, not continuous changes. For continuous changes, you need infinitely many changes to occur. Uh, and that has implications which will be in the background of a lot of what I want to say, although right now the point of it may, may, may not be obvious. So, having got that out of the way, uh, I w want to introduce the notion which is the core of what I want to talk about today, which is a project that is hugely ambitious and I think not yet sufficiently well defined, but in my brain it's, at least there are directions that are clear and you know things that are very relevant to it and things that are not so relevant to it. And it's, the, uh, it's a variation of the project that John Maynard Smith and his collaborator, whose name I can't really pronounce, Samothery, uh, that they had a project which was to Id identify transitions in evolution and they had eight major types of transition which I listed over there and then the features common to each transition for now I don't want to go through those I just want to say that they mentioned only one type of transition does anyone know this work? Yes, okay. Making you? I thought um, I don't know it well, I have to confess. I don't know much beyond this table, in fact. I've read fragments of it. Uh, they only mention one aspect of information processing, and that is to do with communication. And there are many people 
who, and I think there were some indications of that in the earlier discussion, who think that information is essentially something that's communicated. Whereas I'm saying information is essentially something that's used, and sometimes you can communicate it to someone who can then use it. But primarily information is potentially usable by an information user. And uh, there are lots of things that follow from that that are not obvious, which I won't be able to get into. So they talk about information being com communicated, and then one of their major transitions is the change to using a syntactic form of communication with grammatical structure which was a major, major uh, change in communication from making more or less loud noises or whatever it went before, um, or discrete signals. So let's try to say, suppose we try to extend their project. And by the way, I've read some of what John Maynard Smith wrote about information processing, and I was somewhat surprised and wished, I was at Sussex University while he was alive and we met and talked quite often, but I now just wish I'd spent a lot more time talking to him because I realized that he didn't understand the variety of forms of information processing that were already going on in computers. He had a sort of limited notion of kinds of programs that physicists would write. I think he was a physicist or engineer by training. So what he wrote about information processing would fit Fortran programs really well, but not, for instance, logic programs or parsers or whatever, which don't have anything to do with numbers. They build structures. And, and anyway, that's by the way. So. I want to talk about transitions which are relevant to, which involve changes in, the, in information processing. And these changes are of different kinds. And he has a partial list. One can zoom in and out of any of them and go into much more detail. I'm going to just skim the surface for a while. So uh, I have my wonderful prosthetic device, if I can find it quickly which I bought by accident. Um, and it should be, yeah, my pointer. I, I had one which I, a little metal one, which I lost. And I thought I'd order a bigger one, but I didn't realize until it was <laughs> <laughs> uh, But it's quite useful because often what you want is to put it in the shadow. And, yeah. Anyway, so. For any kind of species, there will be what biologists tend to refer to as a niche, or Americans' niche, um, uh, which I'm saying can be thought of as very similar in, in its importance to what an engineer would call a set of requirements. So an engineer who's working on a design for something will have, I mean, depending on the sort of engineer, there's some who just explore and then come out with something. But in many cases, uh, teams of engineers working together have better know what they're trying to build. And that will be specified not in terms of what the thing's going to be at the end, because then they wouldn't need to design it, they'll have the design. But in terms of what things it'll be good for, or what constraints it'll satisfy. And of course, anyone who knows, has who's been through any engineering design project will know that that specification can change during the process of development, because you learn things that are possible, things that are difficult and you, you, from prototypes, etc. But nevertheless, at each stage, there should be a set of requirements, even if that changes. And then what you're aiming to produce is a design that meets that set of requirements when the design is instantiated. So we have a set of requirements. We have a design. As a design is something that can have many instances. For instance, a design for, for a building may be very abstract, like it's made of bricks for the walls and it's got wooden window frames and glass panes and so on, or maybe very specific, these are the exact <coughs> configurations in which the bricks are assembled. So it can be different levels of abstraction and likewise for um, information processing systems you can have different levels of abstraction. Um, but whichever it is, uh, you'll still have a type which can have many tokens or a class category that can have many instances of a design. So design is, is, is not a uh, uh, an instance, it's what's common to instances. And then you can evaluate the design in relation to the set of requirements. And organisms, in some sense, have designs which are not produced by a designer, they're produced by biological evolution, and, and in some cases a combination of biological evolution and individual development, we'll come to that, that's an important uh, point. Um, 
And that design is not encoded anywhere. You might think it's encoded in, in um, the DNA, but it isn't. The DNA is part of a mechanism for producing instances of the design, but uh, the relationship between what's in the DNA and the design, for instance, uh, that this thing is capable of learning Urdu when it grows up, uh, is totally obscure at the moment. So there are requirements, and uh, biological evolution plays a kind of role that we all know about from Darwin, but it's, um, it's quite hard to be very precise about it. And w one of the things that's quite important is that not everything that evolves and survives and gets reproduced is an optimal solution or an optimal fit to some set of requirements <laughs> or in biological terms, optimally fits a niche. All that's required is that it it's adequate. It's uh, uh, in, I think it was uh, Herbert Simon who said biology is a satisfier, not an optimizer. If something is satisfactory, it'll work, it'll work and reproduce and so on. And there might be ways in which it could do better, but if there's not enough competition and, and there are not limitations of resources and so on, this thing might nevertheless work in, even though a change in the design would enable it to reproduce more quickly or, or uh, avoid more diseases or whatever. So from that point of view then, uh, if we want to understand these transitions, uh, it's quite important not just to know what, how the designs change, but also what re new requirements were satisfied by those designs. And sometimes um, that's not obvious. Um, anyway, let's put that to one side. Now, we can talk about transitions in design which affect things like physical structure uh, or which affect the differentiation of physical structure into functions like the number of, of legs or of limbs or that are movable or the kind of muscles it's got or whether it's got a skeleton or an exoskeleton, things of that sort. So there are design changes, and I think these are some of the things that, uh, the sorts of things that the um, Manuel Smith and Nussery book were folk, amongst the things that they paid attention to. Um, uh, and there are also changes in design which influence observable behavior. So for instance, something might walk, something might fly, something might swim, something might be able to reach up into the tree tops and get fruit, and something else might not be able to do without jumping or climbing or whatever, and something may not be able to do at all. So physical morphology and behavior are things that can be observed quite readily, and there's a huge amount of effort that goes into observing them. And furthermore, the physical morphology leaves fossil records, not in great detail because microscopic morphology is very important, often that's lost. Um, nervous structure, for instance, of ancient brains. Uh, but the bone structure and other things, or whatever, give clues. And uh, the behavior is lost in all silly cameras, but you can have footprints, you can have evidence of things that look as if they were made by these things, or brought together by these organs. So these are physical clues to physical behavior. But the information processing is much harder to get at even if you've got the damn thing in front of you behaving <laughs> and you can see all the shape and structure and so on. Uh, what is it that makes it possible for the female elephant to detect that the calf is struggling to get out of the mud pool and needs help and uh, that one way of giving it help is to come along on the side with your leg and push it in a particular way, uh, which I've seen happen on wildlife videos. Or, in another case, instead to go to where the slope is and with your legs scrape some of the mud away so that the slope is not so steep <laughs> and then perhaps either let it go up or give it a bit of a push from behind. Uh, so there's a case where you can observe it and still not have much information about what's going on. What precise information does it have? How much of that is genetically encoded because that's a pre genetically pre-programmed behavior pattern, like lots of mating patterns seem to be, and so on. How much of it was discovered by that individual uh, as a result of previous trial and error that you weren't around to observe? How much of it was a creative solution to a problem here and now, and if so, in what way was the problem formulated 
what forms of representation were there, what resources were available for the solution of that problem, how were the resources selected and organized in such a way that within you know, seconds or so of this thing, the baby struggling, the mother was able to do that. It's very hard to get at the information processing. So if you set yourself the target, which I uh, mentioned uh, on previous slides, although I'm not sure I've stated it verbally here, of trying to identify all the interesting transitions in information processing between the dust cloud or the earliest prebiotic molecule and now, and maybe future ones as well would be of interest, the problem of identifying those transitions is very hard. It, it brings even hard to find out what the information processing is that's going on in front of your eyes. So it has to be, I think, a highly speculative and creative process where a lot of the time you're looking at something and asking how could I make something to do that. And that is, from my point of view, the single most important feature of AI. It enables us to start thinking about information processing in, in natural systems in ways that was just totally impossible previously. So Darwin hadn't a clue how to answer some of the questions that were raised as challenges to him about how minds could evolve and so on. And um, lots of philosophers have asked questions about, about how perception works or what consciousness is and so on. And what I'm now saying is if we can transform those questions appropriately, rephrase them and see that we're still dealing with the same question, we can now try to construct theories using ideas, technology, formalisms, and modes of testing, because we've got apparatus which will run our theory, to try out those theories, and we weren't able to before. Now that's a very different motivation from the motivation that I think most people at this conference have, or at any rate a significant subset, which is to try to produce machines that will do something useful for us in the near future. Uh, by useful I include being entertained and so on, as opposed to solving philosophical problems. And of course some people may have more than one motivation. So, this process of trying to identify these transitions is hard, inherently speculative, requires intellectual resources which we now have that are much better than anything that was available, I'd say even 80 years ago, but since about the middle of the last century, from about the early 50s, um, as people like McCarthy and Minsky and, and Turing and others noticed, we have new ways of thinking about these things. Um, but most of them thought only in terms of human information processing. How can we characterize that? How can we explain that and model it and maybe replicate it? And I have a wild fear. I hope I'm wrong. But it may be that we haven't any hope of getting it right unless we understand lots of other things that were precursors to it because, without our realizing it, many of those precursors are essential parts of the infrastructure still going on in, in current systems, in ways that play a powerful role in providing the functionality of, of brains. That's just a conjecture, or even a question, not even conjecture, uh, not even that I'm committed to it as true or anything. I just wonder if it might be. And I'll give you a couple of... Uh, well, well, let me just finish this list. So you can have transitions in the requirements, and in some sense that's the, the, got to be, even if you arrive at it last, it's got to be the driver of everything else. Uh, it's the criterion against which you evaluate all the other things, if you can get good specification requirements. Then you can talk about the kinds of information processing competences and designs described at different levels of abstraction. Um, and at some low, lower level, you'll start talking about implementations in physics and chemistry. And at this stage, I think there are, we have a lot of ideas about how to implement information processing systems in terms of transistors and electronic systems and so on. But that's not what brains uh, use, and I'll come back to what some of the differences might be. But then if we're talking about um, uh, transitions, there might be transitions in some of these implementation, uh, sorry, uh, transitions in the mechanisms that are used to support various kinds of functionality. So, in principle, it might be the case that you have something that works, it's implemented in a particular kind of physical mechanism, then some change, you know how evolution does these things, changes the implementation so that perhaps it doesn't do that just as well as it did before, but nevertheless it still works. 
But that, as a result of that change, you might have something that can then support a much richer or new kind of information processing. So you may have changes, evolutionary changes at different levels in multi-layered systems of designs and implementations, and uh, that's going to make it add to the difficulty of tracking these things because they're, they're so hard to identify. Um, then one of the things that, that um, is clear from very early stages is that the reproductive process um, doesn't just somehow in one go assemble a fully formed new individual which is like the one before. The bits are assembled and they're assembled in different sorts of ways. Um, in, in some cases, uh, things cluster together inside an organism and then the three organism splits and you've got two things that can then continue growing which are roughly the same in their functionality and their capability. In other cases, there's a central part of the organism, the nucleus or whatever, and you have to make a copy of what's in that to export in the bit that splits off and so on. And uh, some organisms <laughs> seem to have a choice between um, dividing, sorry, this is not really relevant, but it's a fascinating thing I, I only learned about in the last few days. It seems that some, I think that bacteria, have a choice between just dividing and then having two cells that continue growing, or creating uh, spores. So they have to grow something inside themselves which has a kind of protective shell and then plants it outside and then it waits until the time is right for it to grow. And which they should do can depend on factors that, that they can sense in particular how many other things of the same kind there already are. So they start sending out little chemicals uh, and then they count the number of chemicals they get back and if there's more than a certain number of them, so on, then they say, okay, we can divide, it's okay, there's lots of things. And otherwise they will produce the spores. Um, but that's just an example of a change in requirements being met by a change in design which produces change in functionality which um, was already there in very early systems. Um, as things got more complicated, the things that were produced did not have a full specification for what they should be. And uh, we now think of that in terms of learning or development, uh, uh, and there's a subtle difference between those two notions, but uh, one way to think of it is that development has a specification which initiates a trajectory, but precisely how that trajectory goes can depend on what's in the environment. An example of that in humans is language learning. Uh, it appears that humans have the ability to create, I say we're born with the ability to create a language, and which one we create depends on how well our partial creations work in communicating with the others around us. And that produces a language um, which uh, in general will have a lot of commonality with what was there before. So that gives the illusion that this uh, individual was finding out what was used in the environment and then trying to, having to find out what it was, uh, starting to use that language. Um, but the sort of thing that happens when you have a bunch of deaf children who create a new language, or even twins who create a new language uh, of their own that nobody else can understand unless they explain it, indicates that, it's, that what, what we're programmed to do is not data mining, but create something which is constrained by what's in the environment. So that'd be a case where you have the development which specifies a range of possible trajectories, but exactly which trajectory is taken can depend in all sorts of different ways on the environment. And that is sort of obvious about physical growth where the same seed planted in one place will grow tall and plant in another <coughs> place will not grow so tall and so on. And I'm saying the same is true of information processing. And this is closely related to uh, a, a metaphor that some of you will have heard of due to uh, Waddington, um, which was the, um, the landscape, gosh, what was the adjective before? Epigenetic. Epigenetic landscape. So the, the genome provides a kind of hills and valleys where you start somewhere near the top and then various routes down through that to some point at the bottom. And uh, the environment constrains which route each individual takes, which starts with the same landscape. Um, and uh, if I get round to it, I'll, well, I'll tell you now, there's a modification of that metaphor that 
Jackie Chappell came up with when she and I were talking about this, where some organisms can partially change the landscape by digging new tunnels through from one groove to another. Uh, so anyway, the main point is the relationship between the specification, the information that's provided by parent or parents for a new individual, and what actually comes out of the use of that information can have many different, rela the, those relationships can be very different. It may be a very precisely specified structure, um, or it may be something with all kinds of trajectories, spe possible trajectories specified, uh, and selections are taken by the environment, or there may be other things which are different from that, which um, uh, involve not something like a trajectory, but a sort of empty sheet into which information can be absorbed from the environment, and then tabula rasa kind of thing. And then some uses are found for that information that were in some way not at all anticipated by the developmental trajectory. Now, many people think that last thing is the only one that happens. Even Turing, in his 1950 paper, suggested that that might suffice. You start with a large, empty memory, and a powerful learning engine, and you'll find out what it needs to know and be able to do um, I suspect that's totally intractable for the kind of transition between the fertilized human being and a professor of philosophy. Um, and uh, John McCarthy, in a paper called The Well-Designed Child, which he wrote in 1996 in reaction to reading stuff by Elizabeth Spelke on development stuff. Does anyone, has anyone read this book, uh, paper, The Well-Designed Child? It later got reprinted in the um, AI Journal about 2008, but it was 1996. He has a phrase that I like to quote very often, which is that evolution didn't solve the problem of how to build a baby that knows nothing about its environment. But many people trying to build learning systems or trying to explain human learning assume that's what evolution did. Um, again, on that topic, this is a slight digression, but it's been a factor that deeply influenced my, my thinking over many years. Uh, it's quite clear that evolution is capable of producing very competent, newly hatched or newly born animals. I don't know how many of you have ever watched a newborn horse or sheep or, or grazing mammal uh, for an hour or two. Um, very soon, this thing will get up onto its legs, four legs, look around, find the mother, go to where the nipple is and start sucking. And if it's a wildebeest and there's a predator in the environment and the whole herd starts running, Within a very short time after birth, um, the young calves, they just have to be able to run because their mother's can't pick them up and carry them. And uh, they're, they're certainly not left to, to be eaten. Um, there might be some protection of them while they run, but they'd better run at the same speed as the adult mm -hmm. and not fall down every uh, trough in the root or trip over every rock in, that's in the way and so on. So evolution is capable of producing highly competent and sophisticated things. Uh, another example of, of an amazing, uh, to me, totally amazing kind of predetermination in the genome is what happens with organisms that go through a number of phases. So you get uh, a kind of intake that starts as a larva that crawls around the leaves, chewing and chewing, and then eventually it sort of covers itself in a thread or something, forms a cocoon, and turns into soup. And inside the soup, after a while, things start reorganizing themselves, and out comes a butterfly, and it flies away, and goes and finds a mate, or feeds on nectar, or whatever. And um, so you have the specification all there. It's, this isn't a thing working out, shall I be a butterfly with wings of this sort, or that, or whatever. Um, I mean, there might be some minor influence during the larval phase on the details of the, of the subsequent form, but I don't know of any such influence of that kind. Yeah? I found after becoming a parent, that my perspective on babies entering the world changed. Uh, I had this delusion somehow, uh, which uh, I think is very intuitive, that uh, babies mm -hmm. pop in the world, and uh, this is a significant beginning for the baby. But in fact, it's more or less uh, just the day where your head gets squeezed very badly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's not as if they start uh, learning or bootstrapping their mental system, particular on that day, in a no. particular new way. They just get a new class of inputs. 
That's and right. they have already explored their body to a large extent. They have already established sleeping and activity patterns. They have some environmental interaction. They might react to environmental stimuli very clearly and give the mother feedback what they like or dislike before they uh, leave their cozy place inside. And uh, I think it's mainly better to look at this as a very much prolonged area of bootstrapping, which is much longer than for the animals. And so as probably okay. many areas, the jury is still open on how much depends really on the environmental stimuli or how much is still internal bootstrapping going on. Well, I think there are some things we can say about that. Um, but uh, what you're right about that's very important is that there isn't a huge discontinuity at birth. Well, it is quite a big discontinuity. But there's been a lot of development uh, beforehand. Now, going back to one of the earlier themes, uh, a lot of that development in the early weeks at least is molecular information processing. It's growing structures. There's no brain yet. Brain has to be grown. Um, and, uh, and even when the child is born, the neural mechanisms are still pretty immature in ways that I'll come back to which are very important in relation to the difference between so-called altricial species, including humans, hunting mammals, corvids, crows, and so on, and the precocial species that are born relatively competent and well-formed, like the deer and the, the lambs and horses and so on, which can get up and walk and feed themselves and so on, but so the chicks can do that as well. Um, so what, what uh, all this is about is that the processes by which you get from one generation to the next can vary in ways that are not just concerned with what the physical changes are, but also with how much and what type of previous information is provided uh, for the next generation. And um, part of what I was saying is that evolution is capable of providing a huge amount of very specific and very useful information in the precocial mammals and in these things that go through several stages, all pre-programmed, like the, uh, the thing that made the emergence butterfly after the previous two stages. Um, so one can ask what uh, the reasons are for these differences. And uh, Jackie Chaplin and I wrote some stuff for each kind, 2005, and I think I'll give them another thing. But it's not too hard to start inventing reasons why it might be useful uh, for some species uh, to do this in the way that humans, sort of way that humans do, namely produce something that's immature and so on, and then uh, in the same terrain, in the next field, have something that's born much more competent, much more mature, and would go into the precocial end of the artificial precocial spectrum. Um, this is partly related to the RK trade-off. Has anyone heard of the RK trade-off? It's a trade-off between, I forget which is R and which is K, but anyway, one refers to how many offspring you have, and the other has, uh, refers to how much effort you, the uh, parents have to put into the offspring. So uh, you can have lots of offspring that you just let loose, and most of them won't survive, and there are many species that do just that. Um, but there are other species that have very few offspring, and in some cases, and, and, and they require uh, a lot more effort uh, in the form of nurturing and feeding and so on. Um, and there are probably more than two dimensions if you look at the whole variety of things in, in biology. But even amongst the ones where there are relatively few, like the mammals I was talking about, and ducks and chicks and so on, although they have more than humans, um, they don't have as many as fish and uh, frogs and some of the other ones. There's still a variety of, of different, different uh, uh, sort of solutions to the problem of how to reproduce successfully. Now, one of the differences that seems to be quite important is how much the terrain in which the organisms have to survive is fixed. So you will have some organisms that are pretty competent soon after they hatch or start growing or whatever and they can do things very well. 
but they can only function in a relatively restricted range of possible situations, whereas others can cope with much more variety, changes of temperature, living on a hillside as opposed to on flat land or whatever, um, uh, fishing to get food as opposed to catching it, running, things that are running around, etc. So if the organism is going to have to develop quite complicated and varied behaviors depending on what's in the environment because of the way that members of that species move around or because of the way in which climatic and other changes affect the environment which affect this species but maybe not necessarily others like the ones that live underground <coughs> then it may be useful um, especially if these progress these changes are not just cyclic it's that cyclic then the genome can learn what, they, what the repeatable cycles are and put in the competences that are required. But if they are changing in ways that go on <coughs> changing, <coughs> then you need to have a mechanism that can find out where it's got to when it's born, so to speak. And that will especially be the case when different species are competing with one another in various ways. They may be competing as predator and prey compete. So, for instance, if the predators discover new ways of catching the prey, then the new offspring uh, need to be able to find new ways of avoiding the predators of that sort, uh, which might never have existed before. Um, and likewise, if the predators, if the prey discover new ways of escaping, then the predators may have to discover new ways of coping with that way of escaping. So there are different ways in which changes in the environment can produce unpredictable changes. The obvious ones are things like asteroids and volcanoes and earthquakes and ice ages and so on, which are produced by physical changes in the environment. But I suspect that in the long term, the more important ones are the changes in the other organisms in the environment that are in some sense relevant, either as food or competitors or cohabitants or symbionts or whatever, um, mates, etc. So it looks as if uh, one of the important kinds of transitions is development of ways of providing not the information that's needed to specify the next generation's members, but information to specify something that will acquire and use information in quite sophisticated ways. And that, if you think about it, is quite close to one of the advances in programming uh, over the last half century. I mean, early on, programming was done by writing machine code, take your problem, analyze it, write down the instructions, test them, fix it with them, work, and so on. But gradually, the tools for programming became more and more remote from both the machine instructions that were eventually run when the programs run, but also from the end results that were produced. The tools became more powerful and capable of producing more varied end results. Programming languages that, for instance, allow specification of class hierarchies um, provide a lot more flexibility than programming languages that just allow you to define new procedures, which encapsulate a bunch of instructions so that you can then evoke the instructions of the parameters. So, what I suggest is that we see if we look at patterns of change in the history of software engineering or software and hardware engineering, try to understand them in terms of why they occurred, what new functionality they provided, and that may give us some clues as to some of the things that evolution discovered about its own tools for engineering um, and may help us uh, look for examples. And the language learning case, which I've already mentioned, is a fairly obvious one that lots of people wouldn't have thought about. But I think that if you look very closely at humans and monkeys and corvids and various other animals, elephants, and I keep mentioning elephants because they come off an evolutionary branch that goes back to, I mean, our, our earliest common ancestor is way, way back, uh, and I think somewhere in between that common ancestor and elephants or aardvarks little things with long noses or whatever. 
um, which you wouldn't think of as having anything remotely like, say, primate intelligence. So that suggests that insofar as elephants have a kind of human-like intelligence in that they can see things in the environment which afford various kinds of interaction to achieve various goals, like pushing something out of the way or knocking a tree down in order to bring the food, the fruit which is, or the leaves that are out of reach, down to a location where they are in reach. There are aspects of the environment which are common to the evolutionary or, uh, history of, of um, nest building birds and primates and other animals. And uh, what I'm suggesting is that there are things about the, the world that we live in and evolved in that make certain kinds of evolution, of information processing, useful, even in the morphology is very different. Of course, elephants do share a skeleton and various other things with us, but, but nevertheless, the information processing uh, capabilities that they share with us seem to, some of them seem to have developed much later than that common physical structure that they share with us. So these are all examples uh, in illustrating the need to um, investigate transitions in information processing, and many of them involve trade-offs and interactions between different processes. And I've just given an example of the process of evolution, which changed the specification, and process of individual development, which may be, uh, in many species, a result of the evolutionary process producing a new means of controlling individual... Well, oh, you brought some more examples for us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a demonstration of animal intelligence. Yeah. Um, we'll see if we can teach it to do tricks with our sticks. Yeah. Do you, anyone have a ping pong ball? Does anyone have a laser pointer? Um, cats seem to like it. Yeah, yeah. Like this one. So, uh, this, this project that I'm talking about, which is to try to identify transitions in information processing, um, is very complicated. It has very many different categories, and uh, it, it needs uh, ways of thinking that I think were impossible a hundred years ago. Um, and um, uh, it may well be that it needs things that are impossible for us, because we haven't made the conceptual changes of the kind that I've just referred to that we made in the last, last half or three quarters of a century. Uh, before I pause for discussion, I'll mention one that I haven't mentioned before, which um, I think is very important and Darwin had a clue about, and it caused him great difficulty. Um, human engineers discovered that sometimes, if you want to produce some kind of functionality, uh, if you try to build that into a physical machine, it's, well, it's just not feasible to do it, and it's not, um, and there are better ways. And the better way involves building a virtual machine, which can run on a virtual machine. In fact, I assume everyone in this room knows that there are layers of virtual machinery in every computer that we all now use. There's, for instance, stuff in the kernel of an operating system. Then there'll be other things like file systems and networking capabilities and uh, uh, interfaces to various devices, attached to the machine like screen and mouse and, and keyboard and whatever else, microphone if you have one and so on. Um, so there's been a lot of development of physical hardware which is put together and a lot of development in terms of the machine instructions that at some level, at the level of the electronics or digital circuitry, the machine can support. But most of the work that's done in developing things like my machine running Linux and lots of things sitting on top of Linux, like HDBI and Firefox or whatever, which I've got somewhere else, and the window manager that in, oh, uh, never mind, and the window <laughs> manager that enables me to flip through well, 10 virtual desktops, which most of the time is enough for me. Um, so all of that makes use of virtual machinery running on the physical machinery. And the advantages of virtual machines involve uh, many things, one of which is that you can change them very rapidly, whereas changing 
the digital circuit would involve <laughs> disconnecting wires and rerouting and so on, and it's just totally impractical at this level. Although once upon a time, that's how computers were programmed. Uh, there was something generic and you put your program in by actually connecting wires. Turing experienced some of that, I think. Um, so we have introduced uh, ways of producing things that run in the computer, but when we describe them, we don't refer to what's happening to the transistors or whatever, we might refer to what's happening to data structures. And furthermore, the same program can run on another machine that's instead of got, uh, instead of the internal CPU I've got here, I might have an ARM CPU or power uh, PPC or whatever, and the things that Max used to use, but don't really know, or uh, some future CPU that's uh, waiting to be invented. So um, the use of virtual machinery provides a kind of advantage for the designer and user and tester which involves portability, ease of development, importantly also ease of debugging. If something goes wrong and you have to find out what's wrong by finding out what the changes are in the physical states of the transistors, you're in deep trouble if it's complicated. On the other hand, if you have ways of interrogating data structures like contents of arrays or contents of graphs or um, uh, what which of the sub-programs got invoked at a particular point, um, then you may be able to find out what's gone wrong and fix it. Uh, and uh, debugging virtual machines can be helped by adding extra code into programs for keeping track of what the virtual machine is doing. So you have virtual machines that allow bits of virtual machinery to inspect bits of virtual machinery and keep records of it which can be useful if things go wrong, so you can find out what went wrong and change it. Um, and furthermore, as is almost in part of what I've just said, you can have virtual machines which monitor themselves and change themselves or detect that something's happening. For instance, a scheduler might, which is one of the virtual machines, might detect that something's happening which suggests that it might, it ought to lower the priority of a certain class of processes in order to raise the power to, or not allow any more processes to start until some jam has been dealt with. Um, and if that was done by trying to detect patterns in the rates of firing on burst, of switching on burst transistors, it would be totally intractable. But if it's observing changes in data structures that are manipulated by things that support the virtual machine level of the schedule as usual, then it becomes tractable. So that's self-monitoring of virtual machines. The last point about virtual machines before I come to the relevance of biology, which is relevant, is that there are some virtual machines that whose behavior you can describe in a way that just sort of summarizes what the lower levels are doing. But there are other kinds of virtual machines that have what I will call an indefinability relationship to the lower level. And this is controversial, but I don't particularly want to discuss it, spend a lot of time discussing it. I'll just give one example. When a chess program is running on a computer, we can talk about the program at a certain point detecting a threat. So uh, the opponent might have moved a uh, knight to a certain place. The program might have detected that this knight is simultaneously uh, threatening the queen and, and, the, and the king. Or the next move it could, if it uh, a square is left uh, unguarded. Um, the program that's detected the threat can then search for a defense against that threat and it may be able to find one or may not. Um, now, I'm going to assert, and I don't particularly want to discuss this in detail, but I'll, I'll give you a brief reason for what I'm thinking, that the language used to describe what's going on in a chess program when these things happen uses concepts like detect and threat and search and defense and fail and succeed, might succeed in finding a defense and so on. That language, I'm going to say, uh, can allow us to create descriptions of what's going on which cannot be translated into the language of atoms and molecules and charges and chemical bonding and whatever, or even the language of bit patterns uh, that are manipulated with transistors. It can't be translated with an equivalence of meaning. Of course, it's fully implemented. Every case where the detection is happening, 
is fully implemented in the physical machine that happens to be running at that time, by which I mean it doesn't depend on something else, something spiritual in the machine that's not physical, that will be able to survive the destruction of the machine, as some people have supposed a uh, human virtual machine would depend on. Um, why can't it be translated? Well, if you try a translation, you'll end up with a rather long and complex description, which may say something about what's going on in this machine. But I assert, but I can't prove it, that you will not be able to come up with a description that covers all the possible implementations of that virtual, uh, virtual machine. Why not? Because some new development in material science next year or next century may enable a new kind of technology to use to implement a different sort of physical machine within which the same chess virtual machine can be implemented using exactly the same source code but with different compilers. Aaron, do you want to move on to the discussion? It's 11.23. Oh, right, sorry. Mm -hmm. That, that so was meant to be very 30, short. 37 minutes before the end. Right. Well, the claim I'm just going to make is that if Darwin had known about virtual machinery, he would have been able to answer some of his critics who said he can't possibly be taken seriously in claiming that minds and souls and consciousness were products of biological evolution. But if he had known about virtual machinery, he might have talked about transitions in information processing in the way that I've been talking about earlier, which included the development of virtual machines, which can inspect some of their own states, debug themselves, modify themselves, change the goals, and so on, which would have produced at least the beginning of an answer to some of his critics. And uh, Huxley invented the label, um, oh, back up, I've lost it, it'll come back. Uh, for that problem that is now often cited. It's something like the, the great unsolved problem of whatever. Does anyone know what phrase I'm talking about? Not, uh, the, brother eight. Sorry? Not the brother eight problem. The what? Brother eight? No, it's uh, the, uh, the explanatory gap, that's the word. Uh, I think it was uh, Huxley, who was a defender of Darwin, but he said there's this explanatory gap. And Darwin just talked as if he was sure it could be solved. And I'm saying he didn't have the conceptual apparatus to solve it. And likewise, we may not have now some of the conceptual apparatus that we need to answer all the questions that we're talking about. So I've tried to indicate uh, a rather long and complicated and very ambitious research program which involves identifying lots of transitions in aspects of information processing, of which I've given you only a tiny sample, uh, which <coughs> happened between the earliest molecules and what's happened in our recent history. And I think uh, there's probably hundreds more, if not thousands more cases that are interesting and worth identifying and could be added to the work that uh, Maynard Smith and Samathri have done, which doesn't include much about information processing, but a great deal about other things, about molecular structures and cell structures and patterns of growth and development and so on. Um, and if anyone wants, wants to join us and has ideas, uh, you can start make suggestions now and we can continue by email, we might form an informal association of some sort and continue. Yeah. So it, it, isn't, the, isn't your last point about virtual machines very similar to uh, the, the dichotomy or potential dichotomy between sub-symbolic and symbolic or between procedural and declarative knowledge? Did people at the back hear that? Uh, no one's saying they didn't hear. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, an interesting question on which I might have to think some more, uh, but there might be some cases where the sum symbolic and the symbolic have a, a very simple structural relationship, which is a sort of abbreviation, where um, you don't get the indefinability that I was talking about. But I think you're probably right in general that there are symbolic, there are mechanisms of the sort we call symbolic, for instance, a system that operates by condition action rules or by doing logical reasoning and builds um, data structures in a kind of formalism that uses predicates and relations and functions and maybe numbers and names and so on. Uh, and something lower than that, which is patterns of activation in neural nets. Or maybe something that's much more like collections of molecules rearranging themselves. I mean, it, it, one of the things that uh, I keep wondering about is why biological evolution would not have continued using molecular computation 
after for millions of years it was the only thing he had, and it achieved so much, including the production of brains, for instance. So maybe what brains do makes heavy use of what was going on before, but so far we haven't found a way to But that would be another example of what you were saying. Except the bottom level would be different from what you were probably thinking. Yeah, I'm really struck, um, you know, by your observation that certain conceptual breakthroughs we have made have, have enabled us to make tremendous leaps in our understanding of nature, of our own minds, of evolution, and that it's fairly likely that more conceptual breakthroughs are in front of us, and, and you know, I think that... Um, one really needs to keep that in mind. Certain specific people need to keep that in mind when they're arguing that we're safe against an AGI takeoff, that, that we know enough about how this is going to go, that we could get surprised not only in ways some people say there's walls that we're going to smack into, but we could also get surprised by a breakthrough that all of a sudden bumps the rate at which we develop this stuff by a lot. Yeah, and it may also, from a slightly different point of view, for the people who are not so much worried about things taking over and destroying us or look, treating us like babies or whatever, but just want to build much better robot domestic helps or whatever, someone to look after me in my old, old age as opposed to my current old age. <laughs> um, uh, it may just be that some of that can't be done without new supporting technology because the computational power required is of a type that we just cannot achieve with current technology. It's a, for me, it's an open possibility. And I have no, I, I don't have strong feelings either way, but I think we should keep it open. Then you had the... Uh, yeah, so there's, there's a related, but not perhaps not identical way of thinking about general intelligence and how you might work toward the general theory of general intelligence that, that I've been thinking about, which is... I mean, the, to look at look seriously at the relation between minds and, and the worlds. So, I mean, given the infinite amount of processing power, you could make a system that would, that would be intelligent according to any computable reward function, any computable environment. That's what a AXC and the Gordon machine and so forth do. Since we don't have an infinite amount of processing power, what we in practice have to do is make specific systems that are biased toward achieving certain kinds of objectives in certain types of, of, of environments. And so even if they're in principle ultimately <coughs> generally capable, in practice they're going to do better at achieving some goals in some kinds of environments than others. So then, then what a true general theory of general intelligence, which we don't have yet, would do, would be like you could, you could feed into it a description of some objectives and some environments that you wanted. And it would, s and 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 the description of how much computational resources you had in terms of space and time, and it would spit out a description of what system <laughs> could best achieve those goals in those environments given those computational resources, right? So you you could feed a description of Second Life, and the goal is to pick up as many guys as possible in Second Life using using a Commodore 64, <laughs> and it would spit out a description of what's the optimal program that can run a Commodore 64 which would be the best at picking up guys in second life. Or, or you could feed a description of everyday human reality on Earth and the goals that people have evolutionarily had of getting, getting sex, getting food, getting novelty and so forth, and the computational resource restrictions that a human brain typically has. And it would, this hypothetical general theory of intelligence, it would spit out a description of what architecture, using the resources that the human brain has, will best achieve these primordial human goals in, in that environment. Now, there's a lot of obstacles to that right now, <laughs> one of which is we don't have a formal description of everyday human in, in environment and goals. I mean, and, and another one being that, that getting this general theory right is, is, is quite difficult. Now, I, I tried to formalize this using category theory, which, like most things with category theory, doesn't give you anything practical, but <laughs> it gives you some in, interesting interesting conceptual understanding. You know, I think if, if you look at these developmental stages in, in, in that sort of way, it, it, it would seem like the, the environments and goals that, say, a human has at different stages of life, say a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old baby or something, and 
and up up to adulthood. I mean, these are these are progressively more complex goals, and progressively richer and more more complex environments. I mean, when, when you have and a small child, as well as yeah, a child, you tend to put them in, in a limited sort of in, environment, and and you tend there's limited goals that you have that you have them achieve, and of course, much of the play that children do. The nature of play is love. It's actually rehearsal, right? I mean, they're simulated. A lot of play, a lot of play, not all, but a lot is simulated mock versions of things you do as an adult. Like you, you play house, you play store, make you, 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 yeah, make me drive a pretend car, right? I mean, even making beliefs. Yeah, ex yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, sports work are kind of simulations for various kinds of, of battles and so forth. So I think. That, but well, I think what you're saying is right, and I think this is a kind of partial map of what you're saying. Namely, there's a a space of possible designs, and uh, before while you're out, I was saying I yeah, think yeah. there are discontinuities in this space. Although right. that's not necessarily what everybody would say, but and there may be all kinds of relations between classes of design, but there are also spaces. I've called used the phrase biological phrase niche as a, uh, a an alternative label for what an engineer would call a set of requirements. Um, and although biologists use niche in more than one way, but roughly speaking, niche is something quite abstract, which something may or may not fit. So we can have specifications for various kinds of niches, or if you're Americans, niches, um, and their relationships, and then ways of linking designs to, uh, uh, to sets of requirements. And the, this collection of peculiar arrows is meant to indicate that the relationships will not all have the same form. There won't be things like degree of fitness or anything like that. There will be structural relationships. Can do this and can do that, but provide the conditions or so and so, and if this thing changes in certain ways, that'll break down or whatever. So there'll be the kind of complex description you might give of the match between a complex engineering product and the ways it's the, the requirement for it to work. For instance, in the case of an airplane, it may have to be capable of being serviced in a variety of different places. And you just come up with a number saying, oh, this design gets 96% and that one gets 95%. You want to know what the structural relationships are between the airplane and the different servicing requirements and possibilities in different places. So once you've got that, you have the notion which I think Ben was implicitly referring to as trajectories in these spaces. So you may have changes in the, in the sets of requirements and that would correspond to possible changes in the sets of designs. And I think that can happen at the level of evolution, it can happen in child development. So a child in different environments will be, depending on the parents and the toys and the climate and all kinds of other things, the food available, um, may uh, have to or be capable of meeting different sets of requirements. And in the process, it may have to alter its design in terms of the kinds of information processing capabilities it has, which may involve extending its ontology in forms of representation, and uh, it says time we can talk about the need for a child to extend its architecture. So I think there are uh, important ways. Well, one example is language learning. Going from learning a lot of phrases and patterns that work to using a grammar uh, I would regard as a change in an information processing architecture. And the child that got things right previously and said, I ran home and I stuck a picture on the wall, after it switches to using syntax, which is a very different kind of software engineering software, will say, I run home and I s sticked the picture on the wall. And that's because when you switch to the grammar-based, more generative system, it's hard to make it deal with exceptions. But children eventually change the architecture to deal with ex exceptions, and then they start saying, again, I ran home and I stuck it on the wall, instead of I run home and I stick it on the wall, which they didn't say anything. Anyway, those are examples of architectural changes. So yes, I think that um, we need to understand these different kinds of trajectories and different spaces, how they're related. And this may not fit what some people are looking for in a universal or general theory, which would try to collapse all of this into some generic specification of sets of requirements, which would cover all possible um, environments and designs. Uh, but it may well be that you can do something like what Turing did for computation uh, later and find some generic way of representing all of this, including theorems. I'm not laying out hopes for that in this century.
Yeah, so in terms of trying to build AGI, and, and the relevance that this kind of thinking has for it. I mean, I think what we, need, what we need to do, I mean, you have to create an AGI architecture that in principle can deal with the full scope of environments and objectives that an adult human needs to do with, but it, it, it has to have the property that a subset of the behavioral repertoire of the architecture, not necessarily a subset of the components, but each component behaving in a somewhat simpler way than it will in, in an adult mind, and each of the components in their simpler mode of action interacting with each other, so that, that the overall architecture has a kind of simpler overall dynamical mode that can deal with the goals and environments that a young child has to deal with. And then the, the dynamical behavior of the overall system <coughs> has to be able to get progressively more and more complex as the environment and the goals in which the system is presented get, get more and more complex. And I think that it doesn't have to go through the exact developmental phases that a human does, but if you follow through the logic of this, you, would, you wind up with something vaguely resembling Piaget's developmental sta stages. I mean, not, not exactly, and I know developmental psychology has moved beyond that to a long degree anyway, but you, you wound up with, with something vaguely resembling that, because you, you would begin with something like Piaget's infantile stage, which is a mind that is focused just on dealing with sensation and action primarily, and, and on achieving fairly, fairly simple goals in a fairly limited environment. I mean, you want to get food, you don't want to get too cold, you want the, your mom to come near, so you go, why, when, she, when she's away, and so forth, and then once, once you dealt with this simple environment and these simple goals, you've built up with enough to move on to something like Piaget's concrete operational stage where you, you deal with more different kinds of things that are less directly connected to gratifying yourself. And then you learn more systems of concepts, as, as you were describing, and, and systems of behaviors. And eventually, once you can deal with more different kinds of objects and, and situations and achieving more things, that, that dynamic network of activities in, in, in the mind is there, and then you can move on to more complex in, environments and, and goals, and you start moving toward the, the formal stage with, with more and more abstraction. So the, I think you, you, can have a, you can have an architecture where the, the basic components are the same through developmental stages. The dynamical behaviors get progressively more complex as the environment that the system is exposed to gets progressively more complex. And what, what that means is even, even once you've spent all your time, say you spent 20 years building an AGI architecture like, like OpenCog or Crest or whatever it is, when it first starts, it's still a complete idiot and it's stupider than a bird. But if you've, if you've done your job right, you can expose it to progressively more and more complex in environmental situations. and have it have to achieve more and more complex goals in, in, in those environments and then the, the dynamical behaviors within that will, will become more and more complex over, over time. Yeah. And I think well, that's what has to be done. I think other people want to have a chance and uh, I'll come back to what you said later. <laughs> Except I'll say one thing, I think Komarov Smith is much more nearly <laughs> right than Piaget, but that's another story. Yes. So I'd like to make a comment about slide, unfortunately, that you just switched very uh, far away from. Slides and niches slide. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, people can probably remember. I think, I think it's, yeah. Yes. Um, I think the, the, the challenge that that presents to us is to develop some kind of mathematical understanding of what design space means. Because you've presented it um, as, you know, a, a, a two-dimensional Euclidean space, which oh. obviously is a cartoon. I mean, and, and, and that's sort of a, a, a stand-in for some other kind of structure. Um, a lot of people might think that it's a uh, and, you know, high-dimensional Euclidean space. Um, a lot of other people might have the, the intuition that, that that design space is a, is a set of uh, strings of symbols generated by a grammar. Um, and we have a lot of tools for, for dealing with both of those types of things. Uh, we have a well-developed theory of Bayesian inference on Euclidean spaces, and we have Solonoff induction on languages, but it seems to me that neither of those is appropriate to capture the metrical structure 
that we would need to, to identify and recognize these transitions that seem to be so important and that we need some other kind of way of approaching the definition of design space in order to start asking those questions. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, I'm going to describe something very briefly and ask you if it is subsumed by the cases you gave. Um, you probably uh, will accept that the notion of a dynamical system which has some sort of state mm -hmm. is relatively familiar. Yeah. Um, we can add to the class of dynamical systems which have a fixed vector which defines a state, ones that may have data structures that it can create like trees and grass and so on. We can build them out of vectors or we might have build them in some other way. And then we can have a notion that you can have lots of dynamical systems which can themselves be formed into larger dynamical systems and hooked together in various ways. So if we talk about collections of linked dynamical systems, would that be subsumed by the cases you've already got, or would it go beyond that? Everything you mentioned would well, go beyond I, I think that would go beyond it, but I don't think that we have the, the mathematical tools to reason about it in, in the right ways. Because when, you, when you, you introduced all those operators of being able to link things in graphs that are themselves dynamical systems that also have data structures, that combines so many different formalisms that it's not clear how you would go about defining a distribution or a metric. Because that's my half-baked idea of what we really need. There's lots of constraint propagation mechanisms uh, constraining, the, constraining the dynamics. But that's also the ability, to spawn, the ability to spawn new dynamical systems either through learning so that they persist or temporarily when you turn a corner and look at you scene, mm -hmm. rapidly build a, okay. Um, there was something at the beginning of what you said, which I think may still be a loose end. Uh, was there anything you, you thought was? Well, I mean, the, the, only, the only loose end is that we need to figure out how to deal with that kind of thing. Yeah. Yes, and we may have to accept that our current conceptual and mathematical apparatus needs to be extended. Or right. maybe there are things that exist that aren't being used in this domain, yes. and we can bring them in. What do you think of the trans, uh, transition in information processing that gives us the ability to do mathematics looks like? Or put another way, where do we get our, our notion of what truth is and what preserves it? That's a deep question that actually has been driving my own thinking for the last 40 years. Uh, and I'll give you some fragments. I mean, I, I got into AI having first done a degree in maths and physics. Uh, then I went to Oxford in, intending to continue and be a mathematician and solve mathematical problems. Probably I wouldn't have been a good mathematician, but I then <laughs> discovered there were philosophers making statements about mathematics that I thought were wrong. Uh, to a very brief summary, uh, David Hume said there's only two kinds of knowledge. Hume's great philosopher, um, there's a tower commemorating him in Edinburgh and lots of other things, um, and he thought there's empirical knowledge which you can only get, uh, you can't, you only tell what's true and what's false by discovering how things work in the world. You have to do experiments and see what happens, measure things and see how they're correlated and whatever. <laughs> and no matter what you think you've learned, you may find tomorrow or on another planet or in a high temperature that what you thought was true has exceptions. And that's characteristic of empirical knowledge. The other kind of knowledge was essentially I can't remember whether he had a label for it other than relations between ideas. Some people have called that analytic knowledge. Are there any philosophers in this room? People who are students studying philosophy? One. Okay, good. So you can correct me if I get you wrong. <laughs> um, and the other kind, uh, some modern philosophers call analytic, which, of which a trivial example would be all bachelors are unmarried, where in order to understand what you mean by bachelor and unmarried and all X and Y, you already know enough to know that this, to work out that this thing cannot possibly be false without it, there'd be a contradiction. Uh, Kant, reading Hume, claimed that Hume working from his dogmatic slumbers, I don't know what he was dreaming about before that, but he said there's, a, there's something in the middle that Hume hasn't noticed, and he characterized it in, in a number of slightly different ways. One way was that it's not empirical. When you've got mathematical knowledge, you're able to tell if you've done it the right way and haven't made mistakes. And mathematicians can make mistakes. That's a crucial thing. It's being mathematical 
and non-empirical doesn't mean there's anything infallible about the process, okay? Although Kant didn't quite say that. So he called that a priori non-empirical knowledge, um, which involves necessary truths, things that, that not only are true, but could not be false in any possible state of affairs. Um, but he also said of them that they're unlike the or better than a married case, they're not trivial. They, when you make these discoveries, they really extend your knowledge. And you use the label synthetic for that, or ampliatory. Ampli so, whereas Hume was saying it's either empirical or in some sense trivial, kind of said there's stuff in, something in between. And when I was a student, I found that all the philosophers I encountered thought Hume had summed it up. And Kant was proved wrong uh, by the fact that one of his examples for something in the middle was Euclidean geometry. Where you can make discoveries, you discover proof theorems, and then they're necessarily true, and they're not empirical, and they extend your knowledge. And these people thought, well, Einstein showed that uh, Kant was wrong because you couldn't geometry is being refuted uh, because of uh, the uh, observations of Eddington, of light being bent on the sun, which showed that space time is uh, relativistic and, and curved and so on, and doesn't fit Euclidean geometry. But that leaves out the observation that the only thing you have to throw away is the parallel action. And there's a huge amount of other stuff that you can't do without in Euclidean geometry. Um, anyway, so I've been trying to understand what it is that, we, that goes on when we make discoveries. And um, it's in my slides, but I'll just give you one example. You probably all know that the angles of a triangle, any triangle, add up to 180 degrees. Does anyone know how to prove that? Did anyone learn how to prove it as a child? Oh, yeah. Okay. Done it. Not sure I can do it now. Yes. Well, <laughs> almost certainly, those of you who did that, many people, unfortunately, in our education system just get told these things and then they use them and they have no idea that they can prove them. But standard proof starts with a triangle and then there are two ways you can do it, of which the simpler one is perhaps draw a line through one of the vertices parallel to the opposite side and then you reason about the angles over there using the fact that this line is parallel to that. So if a line goes across, there'll be corresponding angles that are the same. I won't go through the detail. Uh, that's the standard proof. Um, one of our former students at Sussex University called Mary Pardo became a maths teacher, and one day she came back saying uh, she found it very difficult to get her student to understand and remember that proof. So she found another one, which I'm not going to tell you, you'll never forget. She said, if you've got your triangle and you point an arrow along the side, uh, one side, then you move it through one of the angles, so it lies on the other side. You, you then can rotate it through the next angle, so it lies on the third side. So it's been through two angles, and then you rotate it through the final angle, and it arrives on the original side, and it's clearly gone through half a rotation. It doesn't cross over itself. <laughs> um, and ended up exactly where it was. And that's essentially what the triangle sum theorem says. The 180 degrees is just a number that comes out of a way of dividing circles into 360 degrees. So that proves, I say, that for any triangle, because I, I didn't make assumptions about how big the triangle was or what the angles were, you can do this. Uh, that upsets some mathematicians, uh, with, and we shouldn't really discuss it in detail. But there are things like that that mathematicians do. And I've been trying to understand what goes on when we look at a proof in Euclidean geometry. There's a whole lot of other things about areas and angles and so on. Um, there is one way you can do it, which is to use the Cartesian discovery that Euclidean geometry can be reformulated by giving all the points coordinates, and then every line becomes a linear equation in coordinates, and so on. And then you translate every geometrical theorem into an algebraic formula of some sort, and then you prove that from some axioms which correspond to the translation of the axioms in Euclidean geometry. The problem is, how do you know that that translation works, that the spatial structures are well represented by this arithmetical space? And um, in any case, there's something that, that is different, the deep ways in which that's different from what happened to our ancestors thousands of years ago who were discovering things probably something like what elephants discover and what monkeys discover and what parrots discover and nest building birds discover. But in addition, our ancestors uh, discovered these things and reflected on them and communicated about them. And eventually, by pro social and other processes, including perhaps the use of writing, 
this all got linked into a large system, which we now call Euclid's ele elements, which had axioms and zeppelin. But what were those earlier stages? And I, when I got into AI in 1969, I started learning about AI and learning to program. I thought, if I can find out how to program a baby robot that grows up the way children and monkeys and so on do, and makes discoveries about spatial structures and rotations and translations, it will be able to do what our pre-Euclidean ancestors did and come up with similar discoveries. But 40 years later, I still don't know how to do it. And I don't see anything close to it in current computational models of perception and reasoning and so on. Uh, my last point on that is that there are things that some people think are like it, but they're different. Namely, you can take a computer simulation of, of physical processes, for instance, game engines have a lot of these things, and you can set up a configuration, and then you can ask the computer to work out what the result will be of something happening. So you can draw a particular triangle and make the computer go through rotating a particular arrow through the angles and so on, and then work out the number of angles, <laughs> the number of degrees of that rotation. It'll tell you it's 180 degrees for that triangle with that configuration. How to get the machine to understand that that's just a special case of something very general which covers all shapes and sizes of the triangle and won't be refuted on Mars and doesn't depend on the color or whatever. But would be refuted if the triangle were drawn on a sphere. Um, if you do the angle of rotation, you can have a right angle, a right angle, and a right angle, so you will have the hundred and more than the two hundred and seventy degree rotation. But if it's in plainness it's not. How to implement those things doesn't seem, it just, I don't know how, but if someone can find a way of translating that process of reasoning or modeling it convincingly on current AI systems or current computing systems, I'd be delighted to learn from you. Have you um, heard of uh, Daniel Douglas Lennart? De Doug Lennart, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, he, he did a lot of very interesting stuff. He was still an automated mathematician. And yeah. And more recently, the psych system. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't think he did anything that involved modeling, including geometry. There no, are people who have, who have tried. Um, well, I mean, there are Euclidean geometry theorem proven systems. It yeah. Would, would work. And that, but that's they assume that you've tra got your logical axioms. Yeah, it seems quite to get from what yeah. you want. Yeah. Anyway, um, maybe it's easy to do, and someone will just do it next year or next week or something. In terms of the future of AI, do you think it's more productive to work on practical problems like driving a car or building a robot cat, or is it more productive to work on a general theory and a mathematical model that you can then use to derive a general intelligence? What do you think? Well, I go with Ben. I'm his father. I have to go. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. Right. Yeah. You don't have to, you know. <laughs> Actually, I tend to go the other way because I'm a sociologist, and that's what I can do, yeah. I guess. I mean, I can look at the practical world a bit, and I don't understand the, the models well enough to judge, but I want to see what you think. Well, we can maybe have a general discussion, but I, I will say that I think there is a whole variety of research projects that probably need to be done in parallel with a lot of mutual information sharing. And in my case, I have two. I want to, because I'm quite sure that what Kant said was a, an accurate description of what happened when I was learning mathematics and doing it and making discoveries that were new for me. And I want to show how, what it is that makes his claim true by showing in much more detail than he or anybody else has been able to so far what's going on. Um, but that's my motivation, and I don't know of anybody else in the world who has shared that goal that I've been working on for 40 years. I've tried to recruit other people to help me, but so far they've all had other things. But I think there are, there are other goals. There's also the goal, which I also share, of trying to understand what biological evolution produced. What is it that these monkey brains and squirrel brains and human brains... By the way, have any of you um, uh, met grey squirrels defeating squirrel-proof bird feeders? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the, you can buy bird feeders that are advertised as uh, being squirrel proof and you put the nuts in and birds will get them. But in general, they, there will be a squirrel that defeats every one of them. One of the, you can go to YouTube and type in some collection of words like squirrels and nuts and birds or whatever and feeder, 
and you'll see some very funny things. I'm sorry, I can't resist the temptation. One of the funniest involves uh, um, a feeder that has the nuts in a kind of conical thing, and um, there's a base which has supports that birds can land on, and then they can pick in through holes and get the nuts. And this base uh, has a measuring device that can detect the weight of what's landed on it, and it also has a motor, an electric motor, and if anything that lands on it is heavier than a bird, it starts rotating. So there are wonderful videos of squirrels climbing up, getting on this thing, and then being thrown off by this rotating thing. Uh, there's also a video of a squirrel that tried to do that, and it got on, and it hung on for a while, and got thrown off, but it came up again, and the second time it hung on. <laughs> and while it was hanging, lots of nuts got thrown out. <laughs> and then it went down. <laughs> And I don't know whether it had worked it out from one thing. But the things I've seen squirrels do, including when they climbed up a, a patio door in our house to get to a squirrel-proof, I thought, bird feeder, which is stuck in the middle of a glass window, glass patio window, with suckers and a little tray that the birds could come and land on. This squirrel sort of climbing up the edge of the doorway with, you know, it's got about half an inch thick plastic surround frame, um, climbing up. I didn't see it as my wife did, we've got it on camera, uh, the, the end result. Uh, and it climbed up until it was just a bit higher than this, this um, feeder. And then it launched itself sideways. Now think about it, you're the squirrel hanging there. <laughs> if you release your grip, you're going to drop down. But you've got to release your grip in order to impel yourself sideways. So the squirrel had to find a way of doing a ballistic, highly intelligent, controlled, very rapid action involving letting go and pushing in such a way that it didn't go flying off away from the glass or bumping the glass and bounce off. And it landed on the tray. It didn't land exactly on it, but enough to clamber on and then eat the nuts. And then it jumped down later. Uh, sorry, I, <laughs> or an example of the kinds of things that make me wonder what, how far we've got to go to understand natural intelligence. Um, so there, there are people who are interested in natural intelligence. I'm interested in it. There are people who want to make new, useful things. I'm not so interested in that, but I'm glad someone might maybe give me this help for when I can't dress myself anymore, if they get that far in that time. So they need all to talk to me. Right? You, you, you had a slide of, I think, eight phase, uh, natural uh, information processing phase transitions. Um, and I think the last one was primate societies to, to modern human societies. Uh, do you consider um, the transition from modern human societies to the internet to be uh, a ninth natural information processing uh, phase transition? Okay, the things that I had thought about involved cultural changes, and for humans those are particularly important, but the humans are not unique. There are other organisms that can uh, develop a way of doing things that they pass on. A culture is something that persists across generations. Um, and the internet is an illustration of something that goes back uh, long before the internet, namely that human knowledge, when transmitted, allows generation, new generations to do things that couldn't be done before, including altering the infrastructure within which future generations develop. So that includes building skyscrapers and railway systems and telephone systems and TV communications and, and now the internet. And it may well be that there is something about the internet that is qualitatively so different that one will have to study it in ways that go beyond anything that I've written, and, but maybe other people are already thinking about that. I don't spend too much time thinking about it because um, my interests are, are elsewhere. And I look at some of the stuff that's being done about the internet, and I don't think it's going to meet its requirements, but maybe it will, maybe it won't. I think most things that happen with the internet uh, are fall into either two camps. They're very useful um, and save an awful lot of time, like Google and Wikipedia and so on, or very nasty. <laughs> and sometimes that's obvious, like the things that make people lose lots of money and whatever because they fall into a trap. Uh, or they're nasty in other ways, namely they're sucking information out of us without our knowing and in ways that may initially help us because the advertisers then can advertise things that we're interested in. So I, I, I think the most important part of my question is, do you consider it to be natural? 
Um, oh, uh, sorry, uh, from my point of view, skyscrapers are natural. They're products of biological evolution. The internet's products of biological evolution. Rockets are products. Yes, so in that sense, they're as much natural as termite cathedrals are. Termite cathedrals are, are very interesting structures. Yeah. Any more? It's exactly noon, and you tied it, it up. Is, it, is, it is exactly noon. I mean, ah, right. We could go a few more minutes if people have more yeah. to say. I'm happy to do it. Otherwise, let, let us uh, thank Aaron. <laughs> This sequence of pictures, which isn't very clear, was partly what I think Ben was talking about earlier. The genes can produce physical structures that produce behaviors, and that's how the simplest organisms work. Um, the genes can also produce rather generic kinds of behaviors, uh, which are called competences, which will produce different behaviors in different conditions in some way that might even allow these to be modified. The genes can produce things that produce things like that, in a way that depends on the experience of the individual. Um, and maybe they can also uh, <coughs> produce meta, meta, meta competence. And I think humans have uh, many layers going off in that direction, as well as reflexes of this kind, which are very immediate. You know, I think reflexes and all the kinds of things that go on in digestion and so on. Um, but how to make all that work in, in robots in sensible ways is not clear. But mathematical reasoning may require something where you get some competence, but then you also discover, and that competence uh, may become quite elaborate, and for instance, in, uh, skills for building things and moving things around or whatever. When you start reflecting on it, that meta competence might enable you to start asking questions about that competence, which enables you to go up in new directions. And um, I don't know how many other animals can do that. Yeah. This is reminiscent of uh, the work of Valentin Kuchin about uh, metasystem transitions. I'm sorry, uh, this is about the form of the Similar to the, the work of Valentin, Valentin Kuchin on oh. metasystem transitions. No, I, I don't know that work. I think it uh, can be interpreted as related to Annette Komolov Smith's notion of competences which are acquired empirically in, uh, or by training or whatever which organisms uh, then change by going through a process that she calls representational redescription. And I don't think she has very, very precise ideas about what that might be. Well, the metasystem transition of Turchin, who was a, a Russian systems theorist, and this is, he described in the, in the late 60s. And I mean, this was a more general systems theory notion where you have, if you have a complex system of, of agents interacting and doing things, as they get more and more coupled together, at some point the nexus of control passes to the next level up. So for example, historically, you have cells swimming around doing individual stuff. Eventually cells interact so tightly and trend into an organism. You could say in some level, the nexus of control passes to the next level up, the organism. And then after a metasystem transition like this is passed, there's some phenomena that seem to follow that in a variety of systems, like he called the Oh, I, f I forget the phrase, but the, the, the diversification of the penultimate layer, like the layer below the highest level of control, it tends to become quite diverse, just like we have so many different cell types. Well, an in the example body. of that diversification might be the verbal competence, which is pattern based, which, when it's re, re represented as syntax based, enables you to extend the envelope uh, essentially infinitely using recursion or whatever. And uh, I don't know how many of those transitions there are, but she talks about a lot of them, and I think there are more than anyone has ever noticed in, in young children and other animals. But she also distinguishes making that kind of transition, which is one form of representational redescription, transforming a competence into a new formalism that has more power. A new architecture might be required as well, I think. Um, and that's separate from developing a meta-competence which enables that transition, it's that new state itself, to be reflected on and thought about and so on. Or another development is the thinking about it going on in others. So if you can only think about your own thoughts, you won't be able to be a good teacher. But in humans, there is the ability to detect such transitions going on in other people and also noticing when they're having trouble. 
and then scaffolding their future development. It's good teachers do well and bad teachers do badly. And then a yet further later stage might be a community codifying all this stuff that's going on. So if this Russian person you mentioned has been through all that stuff, I expect Annette would like to know about it too. And if I get the reference from it. But presumably he hasn't implemented it. It's a sort of mathematical <laughs> theory. Yeah, yeah, it's a conceptual mathematical. Yeah. Okay. And he's dead now, so he's not going to. <laughs> <laughs> not in this world. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And, um, uh, I'm very happy to have collaborators, but I refuse to apply for grants. I think the ratio <laughs> of effort to <laughs> successful <laughs> progress and the writing of reports and so on doesn't make it worthwhile at my age. And uh, <laughs> nobody can sack me because I'm retired. <laughs> and that helps. But I don't mind if other people want to apply for grants to do this kind of thing. And um, if I can help you do that, I'll do it. <laughs>